upstairs from his morning bath and flopped into his seat next to his father on the couch. I smell strawberries, he remarked. You smell strawberries, his dad questioned in a hushed voice. Yeah, quizzically, replied Bob's son, Matthew. You know what it means when you smell strawberries? It means the strawberry ghost is coming to get you. You know when you play in the grass and you see the little strawberries growing here and there? Yeah. Well, our house was built in the very same spot that an old strawberry farm used to be. It's been said that the farmer used to chase the little kids off his land to keep from picking his strawberries. But I knew the old farmer. He was running after the children to share his harvest. He was very proud of what he grew, and he wanted the little boys and girls to come and sit at his picnic table and eat the biggest, ripest berries ever. So if you smell strawberries, don't be afraid. It's just the strawberry ghost coming to share his bounty. Just as Matt's dad finished spinning his story, Matt's mom briskly entered the room from the kitchen with an incredible treat. Who wants strawberry tarts with whipped cream? She's saying with a bright smile. Matt Matt gave a sideways glance at his father, realizing that dad just made up one of his big fibs and chortled, oh dad. What's so funny, laughed mom as she handed out the treats. Hey chubby, said the school bully as he poked Matt Matt in his little belly and scoffed when it jiggled. Your dad told you only part of the story. He wasn't joking around. When you smell strawberries, the ghost is coming to get you all right, but he wants your fat that jiggly wiggly baby fat booger butt. He uses it to make his pies, you know, to grease his pans and make his crusts. It's better than Crisco. And you certainly got the makings for a fine pie, Bubbles. Ah, uh, I bet you he giggles just like the Pillsbury Doughboy, chimed in one of the gang members who surrounded Matthew with their bikes just so he couldn't get away. Ryan, hold him down so I can give him a pink belly. Every day, his oppressors would torment and bully him around the school, making fun of the little baby fat that seemed to cling to him, though he was almost seven years old and was very active with ice hockey, soccer, and music as a percussionist. The kids at school would surround Matt at the monkey bars and start chanting the tune of London Bridge. When the strawberry ghost comes to town, he'll come around and hunt you down, tie you up when you are found, and make you skinny. It seemed to Matt that all the kids older than him were lean and trim. His dad assured him that in time, he will just wake up one day and realize all the baby fat will be gone, and so will the teasing. The week dragged on and the teasing and the chanting at the school started to unravel Matt's nerves. In every corner he felt something was lurking in the shadows. The smell of strawberries would waft by the on spring breeze only to force Matt to shiver and dread the next message from the strawberry ghost. There's no such thing as ghosts, especially ones who bake pies. How preposterous. Matt liked how that word felt when he said it out loud, punching the P's and the S's. It's like that fairy tale with the witch in the woods and the gingerbread house, he pondered. They're always after little boys and girls to eat them or something. Matt finished lacing up his hockey skates and noticed he was the only soul in the locker room. Matt realized he was lost in thought and needed to hurry and catch up with the team getting on the ice. Then, without warning, the motion-activated light to the locker room shut off with a click plunging Matt into the gloom of darkness. The blackness was menacing as Matt spun around looking for the swinging doors, but the exit sign must be out as well as the light in the hall beyond the locker room. Within the darkness, Matt heard unintelligible sounds and sensed a freezing cold that engulfed his body. He shivered and his teeth chattered. He was more nervous than cold. Finally, Matt felt that his eyes had adjusted to the bleak darkness and that he could see a small red light like it was in the distance. Probably the exit light down the hall, he mused. Matt moved closer to the red light. Another red light appeared to its left. A reflection off the door glass, Matt guessed. Then the red lights blinked. Stunned, Matt blinked twice and the red eyes looking at Matt through the void blinked twice in response. Matt gulped a huge breath of air, and before he could let out a scream, 
Come on, they're on the ice, let's go. Matt's dad blurted as he punched through the swinging doors to the locker room. Let's move. Dad, there's someone in here, Matt shouted. Who else is late? Where, Matt? I don't see anyone. Dad, you didn't see him in the hallway? No, I didn't see anyone. Did they hurt you? Do you know what they look like? Matt's dad asked worriedly. No, no one hurt me. I, I didn't really see anyone, but there were these red eyes that were glaring at me in the dark. Oh, come on, Matt. You were imagining something. Look, it was the light on the side of the exit sign reflecting on the windows and the doors. See? Matt's dad swung the doors in and out. See? Now let's get on the ice. I will inspect the locker rooms just in case. Matt looked forward to Monday. He's principal percussionist with the Senior Youth Orchestra. It was an amazing feat to beat out music students more than twice his age for much coveted positions as principal. This, this indicated that Matt had the skills to outperform the others as well as an understanding to express music. And at his very young age, the maturity to manage his section and instruct on all the percussion instruments, including timpani, xylophone, cymbals, triangle, snare drum, bass drum, tambourine, maracas, gongs, chimes, and glockspinel. One of the high school seniors constantly haunted Matt by hiding his mallets, making Matt the last to leave. Matt often referred to this musician as Ferret Face when in conversation with his family. This night, Ferret Face placed a large, very soft-headed mallet, the one that's the most expensive, under the marimba cover, to Ferret Face making a rather large and noticeable bump to the instrument. Matt was frantically looking for the striker as his mother was glancing at her watch while conversing with the wife of the artistic director. Aha! I found it! Matt cheered, seeing noticeably oblong bump in the marimba. As Matt ducked under the cover to grab the mallet, the lights abruptly cut out. Matt let out a blood-curdling scream, and a bony hand grabbed Matthew's wrist while a voice engulfed him in a spooky whisper. It's time to almost make some pies, Matthew. The whisper drawled on. Matt, you all right? Where are you? Mom shouted in the darkened room. That parrot kid turned out the lights and then some man grabbed me. Matt whimpered to his mom without showing any fear to not give back that bad kid any satisfaction. The school went on instant lockdown as they searched for that man that Matt said grabbed him. Searches of the rooms and hallways revealed nothing as well as the security cameras turned up nothing. All the adults agreed it was an active imagination and that everyone was tired and to call it a night. No harm, no foul. Finally, Friday night arrived and the next morning was Matt's birthday. His family had big plans to celebrate his birthday. All his friends from his hockey team were invited over for a backyard barbecue and a roller hockey game in the cul-de-sac. Mom and Grandma shocked Matthew with an early surprise party of their own Friday night with an 8-inch high strawberry shortcake. Strawberries, Matt squeaked with the look of dread on his face. I thought you liked strawberries, Angel Face, soothed Mimi, Matt's grandmother. I, I do, moaned Matt. The kids at the school were telling ghost stories and they got under Matt's skin, interrupted the father. Don't worry about it, Matt. In a couple of days, it'll, it'll be over with. You'll see. Okay, well, let's have a party, pronounced Mom. Somehow, Matt finished half the cake all by himself. The fresh strawberries and smooth, soft whipped cream was just too good to pass up. Feeling plump and satisfied, Matt tumbled into a plush, comfortably soft bed and began to doze off to dreamland. Outside his bedroom door, Mom and Dad teased Matt with spooky noises and reciting the incantation the pulleys at school were chanting. Mom, Dad, stop that, bawled Matt, startled back to consciousness. It's just a rite of passage, son. It will be over come the morning, Matt's dad voice trailed off in the distance as he descended the back staircase. Matt shook his head and scoffed at his parents' behavior. His father could be so obscure at times. Matt laid back and stared, observing how the stars and planets he and his mom glued to the ceiling 
when he was younger glowed in the darkness. He counted the planets, and when he got to Uranus, he snorted the punchline of his of his dad that a joke he always says, Klingons of orbiting your anus. Matt closed his eyes, rolled over, and rubbed his nose into his pillow, smelling the fresh, clean sheets his grandma put on the bed that morning. Again, Matt felt himself drifting off, finding comfort in the soothing crackle coming from the fireplace downstairs. Matt floated back to cognizance, grasping the concept that he should not be able to hear the fireplace through his bedroom door and that the sound was more like paper being crinkled up emanating out from under his bed. The room became blacker than black, like black could be infinity. The crackle sound from under his bed was swirling around and Matt could see green sparks striking out from beneath the bed and ricocheting off his Star Wars posters. Matt cringed and grasped the edge of his mattress, gulped a breath of air and screamed silence. <laughs> he made no sound, like the air in the room had vanished. I'm here for you, Matthew, drawled a deep male southern voice. It's time to make some pies, you and I. Matt's room flashed with blinding lights, which smoldered down to reveal surgical lights. His bed, now a steel surgical table with leather straps holding Matt Matt so tight he could not budge an inch. To Matt's left was a man bent over an adjustable table, busily making clanging noises that rang a high pitch. But each time the man bent over or moved around, he produced the sound of twigs brushing together and leaves rustling. Matt struggled frantically to free himself, rocking the operating table from side to side. The doctor's assistant turned toward his patient, and Matt was finally able to see his face, or what was resembled to a face. It was a bundle of straw, lifeless, without no eyes, nose, or mouth. The scarecrow moved closer to little Matt Matt, and the young boy's shrill scream reverberated in the metal domes of the surgical lamp staring down at him. A shadow appeared blocking the light. None of that now. You're a grown boy. The same deep, drawling voice soothed. It's time to lose that baby fat and make some pies, you and I. Y'all don't want to be carrying that weight around with you, now do you, boy? Haha. <laughs> the ghost laughter echoed off into the barn's rafters. And you baby fat, trailed the spirit. Well, it makes my pie crust like flaky. I think I got my recipe from Betty Crocker with a slight alteration. The southern voice leaned closer to reveal an old man with spinach green skin, strawberry red eyes, and yellow teeth that looked like rotten corn. Overwhelmed by the sour stench of rotten strawberries, the birthday boy nearly upchucked his birthday cake. Excuse the theatrics. My assistant, who will remain silent, likes to glamorize this turning moment in a young boy's right to passage. And with the wave of his hand, the surgical room was turned into an ordinary barn. Light streaming through the cracks in the wooden boards dappled an eerie light onto Matt's jelly, quivering belly. The strawberry ghost gazed upon the stomach, glowing like a pink, ripe grapefruit under the sunlight. The straw-faced scarecrow swooshed and crackled to a position behind Matthew's head and a snap bent down to brace Matthew for what was about to happen next. With a grand gesture, the ghost raised his hand and pointed his little finger to the ceiling, growing a silver scalpel from the nail, wishing through the air, swinging the blade across Matt's abdomen. Matt screamed and ran, and punched with his legs, kicking the blankets off his bed, and answered to his mother's voice calling him down for breakfast. Matt! Matt, come down for breakfast. Stunned, Matt popped open his teary eyes and looked around his bedroom. The morning light gleamed in the window, showing nothing was changed. A map of the universe graced on one wall, Yankee's poster on another, and Darth Vader eyeing Matt in disapproval of the Force. <laughs> A rooster crowed from Bailey's strawberry farm. Matt quickly washed his face, brushed his teeth, and skipped down the stairs to join his family for breakfast. Good morning, Angel Face, called Grandma as Matt bounced into the kitchen. You look well rested. 
Happy birthday, sweetie, welcomed mom as she placed chocolate chip pancakes and sausages on the antique English tea table in front of her son, kissing him on the cheek. You look like you're losing weight, honey. Are you feeling all right? Worried grandma. Nah, I don't think so. I had a bad dream. Matt chimed as he looked down upon himself and noted his pajamas were a little baggy. Matt pulled up his pajama shirt and stared in amazement at his scar-free belly. Hi, Matt. Happy birthday. I see you've paid a little for your rite of passage, blurted Matt's dad, strawberry feeling evident on his lips. Want some pie? 